Hello, we're rolling. My name's Zeke. I'm a software developer uh, working mostly in JavaScript and Node. I wanted to make a quick video to show you how I'm making Node modules these days. So I've been working on some internationalization stuff and I've noticed that um, sometimes people don't know what this term I18N means or what L10N means. And these are, turns out these are called numeronyms and they are abbreviations for longer words like internationalization and localization. So the pattern here is basically you take a long word, extract the first letter and the last letter from the word and put a number in the middle which is the number of characters in between the first and last letter. So I want to make a little node module um, that numerizes numero, numero, numero names words uh, just for fun. So the first thing I'm going to do is just create a directory called numero nims. Numero nim was taken on npm, but it looks like numero nims is available. Also, this when I designed the npm website, this was a shout out to rubygems.org, which has a similar message, and their their message in turn was a shout out to Wayne's World, in which Wayne Campbell wants to buy a fancy guitar, but he can't afford it yet, but someday it will be his. Oh yes, someday it will be his. So anyway, we make a directory, neuronyms, pretty simple, cd into it, and then I like to use yarns uh, package JSON in it instead of npm because it has some better defaults. So we'll just call the package neuronyms, um, turn words into neuronyms. And it's going to be on my personal GitHub account. Numeronims. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we look at our directory, we've got a package chase on there. I'm going to add an index.js and a test.js. And let's just start adding some dependencies that I know I want to use. So I tend to use a uh, standard for my JavaScript projects, and lately I've been using a test framework called Jest, which is made by some people at Facebook. And normally I use Mocha or Tap or Tape, depending on the circumstances, but just recently getting into Jest and liking it. So while that's installing, I'll pop up in another directory. And Go ahead and edit this code, and I'm going to start by writing some tests. So the nice thing about Jest is that it brings in a bunch of globals for you automatically, so you can just start saying, you can just start writing test cases without requiring too many, without requiring a bunch of modules or setting a bunch of boilerplate. So our module doesn't exist yet, but let's just pretend it does. So going to be in the same directory, so that's how I'll require it. And then we'll say test um, is a function. So I usually like to start with a very basic test just to prove out the functionality. So we'll say uh, expect type of, oops, I spelled numero num wrong up there. Type of numero to be function. And you'll notice there when I typed, I started typing 2b, we've got all these suggestions here in Visual Studio Code and that's because um, the Jest module has TypeScript definitions. So even though I'm writing JavaScript, I'm still getting all these IntelliSense suggestions that are sort of context aware. So that's, we want it to be a function. Um, we want to say it numerizes words. So we'll do an example. So expect numero nim, keep typing num, accessibility to be i18n. We'll do a couple in here. Localization, l10n. 
and just for fun, British spelling, let's support that too. Um, and then what happens if the input is bad? So handles non string input. So let's say we call numero nim with nothing. We could throw an error, but I'm just going to go ahead and say we'll return null if the, if the input is bad. Actually, let's handle a few cases. So given an object, that should be null as well. Given a number, also null. It should returns source returns input string if uh, too short. So if I try to numerize the word I, there's not enough letters in there for there to be a number in the middle. So this should just be high. If we want to numerize the word cat, you could say that this would be <laughs> C1T, but that's kind of silly because you're not economizing there. So let's just say for anything three characters or shorter, we would want to just get the input string back. So that kind of covers the majority of cases. Um, let's actually see what happens if we do an empty string as well. So here we've got no input, we've got a string, we've got an object, and a number, and all those things should return null. Am I still recording? Yes, okay. So now the test exists. Um, I'm gonna use a tool called NPE to edit my package JSON from the command line. So if you don't have NPE installed, you can use, and you have a ver recent version of Node, you can use NPX, which will just download and execute NPE automatically without in you installing it. So if I say NPE scripts.test, and I want this to be jest and standard fix, this means I'm setting the value of scripts.test in my package JSON to this. So now if I cat package.json, you'll see that's set. Or if I just do NPE scripts, you can see the value. So from an, I've recently used, worked on another project um, and used some nice features from jest. So I'm gonna try and find those in nice registry, cool story repo. So this jest command will watch your code, notify you if it passes or fails, but only notify you when it changes between a passing and failing state. So it's pretty handy. So I'm going to say npe watch, and the value of that is going to be this. So again, if we do npe scripts, we can see we have it. Oops, I set that wrong. NPE scripts.watch. All right, so I blew that. Let's clean that up a little bit. Uh, we don't want the watch command here. We want it as a script. So now, if we run npm test, oh, npm tst is apparently a secret alias for npm test. Good to know. So of course, Yeah, we didn't expect this to work because we haven't even written any of the code yet. So let's actually start working on index.js and write the code. So it's going to be a simple function. It's good to name your functions because if you have errors, the stack trace will refer to this function name. You could use an anonymous function like this, but it's helpful to give it a name for debugging. So, and we want, we're gonna take input. So we'll say, if not input, return null. If type of input, 
does not equal string return null. And I used to, I like to use these this pattern of early returns. So just bailing from your function right away if something's wrong. If input dot length is less than or equal to three, return input. So if we get to this point in the code, we know we have a string. We know it's at least four characters long. So now we can perform the operation on it, um, the numerification. So it should be pretty simple. It should just be uh, the first character. So we can do input dot char at. I think that's a thing. I'm going to check. I'm going to go over to node real quick and make sure. So foo food char at zero is f char at three is d. Okay, so that's what we want. We could also do like food sub zero. That works too. Char at is a little more explicit and you know you're working with a string rather than an array. So we'll say foo char at zero plus, and then this is the number part in the middle. So we want to say um, Whatever it is, we're going to cast it to a string just to be safe. Even though string plus a number should take care of it, this is just a little more explicit. It makes me feel comfortable that it's actually going to work. The number here is going to be input dot length minus two to account for the first and last letter. And then the last part is going to be input dot char at input dot length minus one. So that should be the last character. So I think that's it. Uh, let's see what happens if we run the tests here. I'm going to close that. We don't need that anymore. Let's run npm test and spell it right this time. OK. Type of input does not equal string return null. So parts of it are working. Um, what's going on here? String is not defined. OK, I referred to something as string. That should have been like that. Oh, let's try npm. Let's try running the watch command so that we can just get continuous feedback as we write the code. Okay, so the first time it runs, it kind of does this weird thing where it didn't run any tests, but 100% of them passed. So I think that's kind of a bug in jest. But um, if you type the letter A, it runs everything. And we're looking a little better here. So, um, Oh, of course, accessibility would be A11Y, not I18. <laughs> um, if you're watching along and that was kind of unbearable for you to watch me type the right, the wrong thing, I'm sorry. What is this thing stuck on my screen here? Internationalization. Looks right. And now, look, our tests are passing. And the cool thing about the jest command we're using here is that it actually shows us places where we're not fully, we don't have full code coverage. So line four of index.js is not being tested. So it should be tested. Um, oh, I guess we don't have, doesn't that test it? Oh, again, didn't even call the function here. So this should be numero nim hi, numero nim cat. So the nice thing about that code coverage thing is that it actually shows you when you're making mistakes um, along the way, because I probably wouldn't have noticed that even though my tests were passing. So um, here we now have 100% code coverage. We wrote the tests before the implementation and we're pretty happy. So we can actually kill this. Um, and this would be the, the point when I would normally actually create the Git repository. So I'm gonna create a Git repo and I use a tool called Hub. Hub is like, I have it aliased as Git. So when I type um, Git create, that's actually a hub command that lets me create a repository from the command line. So 
I'm going to get create numero nims. And by default, it's going to create on your personal account. So this is the equivalent of that. So if you wanted to create it on a different org, you could type the org name here. If it's on your own account, you just leave it blank. And let's try a little bit of magic here so that you can use you can use a P flag to specify private, but this is going to be a public repository, so I'll leave that there. This is for D is for description. So let's see if we can actually do this. I don't know if this is going to work. Let's try it though. Okay, then let's commit our code. So um, I don't want the coverage directory to be part of my um, repository because it's just an artifact running the tests. So let's ignore that. And as a good practice, I like to ignore .env, .npmrc, and node modules, even though it's in my global. Sometimes Travis doesn't know to ignore that, or your CI doesn't know to ignore that. So that's a good default git ignore. So then, Typically, I'll pop open GitHub Desktop to get kind of a visual, uh, a more visual view on the changes I've made. So it's all there. Everything looks good. I don't have a README yet, though. So um, let's actually publish the first version of the module, and then we'll we'll um, add a README and bump the version. So um, commit all the things. And commit is a, a function that I use that basically adds everything in Git, stages everything, and then um, uses whatever I type after the word commit as the commit message. That's pretty handy. Also, I use this to allow empty things, so if I want to actually make empty git commits, sometimes that's that's convenient too. So I'm going to push this up. The U just kind of sets the sets the remote. You only have to do that once. And I use this tool called GHWD, which um, you can install with. GHWD and it opens up your current working directory in Git. So if I type G and hit enter, it opens my browser. I can jump to the code and see what's going on here. So it looks like my little trick to try and grab the description from package.json actually worked and set the default description on the repo. So I know there are cooler ways to do this, but what I'm going to do is um, actually I'm going to go to Travis right now and see if I can turn on CI for this repository. So it's probably not in here yet. Um, no, so I need to sync my account. And if I try this again, didn't work. Okay, maybe I need to refresh the page. Okay, sometimes Travis doesn't pick up all the changes, so let's come back to that in a minute. So for now, um, I'm Zeke. Okay, good, I'm logged into NPM. Um, and if I look at my version in package.json, it's 1.0, so I'm actually ready to do a publish here. So I usually do the first publish manually. After that, I'm, I use semantic release. So there we go, we're good to go. We should now be able to see, if I refresh this page on NPM, there's the package. Doesn't have a readme yet, but we're gonna fix that. Okay, so um, let's set up semantic release. So this is pretty straightforward. Um, you wanna run semantic release CLI setup and I usually use npx here just so that I know that I'm always getting the latest version of semantic release when I run this command. So it starts a little wizard, asks you what npm registry you want to use, my npm username. And this has been failing recently lately. Um, 
yeah, so I don't know what's up with this with semantic release, but actually what works for me is if I run npm who am I, somehow that appeases the gods sometimes. Ah, still not working. Let's try it again. So I have an issue for this on semantic release. Okay, so we got it past at that point. Um, GitHub username, and I don't have my phone on me. So let me grab that. Okay, 259291. And we're using Travis CI. Oh, but it's probably going to break because we didn't turn on Travis yet. Maybe we don't have to turn on Travis. Maybe this is a lesson for me. Okay, so uh, if we look, if we check our Git status, we'll see. It's kind of easier to view in GitHub Desktop what happened. So, semantic release created this. Um, version number in package JSON that's never going to change anymore. It's always going to be 000, zero, zero development, and it's up to a machine or a computer or a program now to determine the, the versions going forward. Semantic release added itself as a dependency, and I don't actually know what this Travis deploy once thing is, but we're going to just leave it there. Um, set up some scripts, and if we look in our Travis.yaml, I don't think this code is using super new node features, but in general these days I am um, with modules like this, I am only testing them on node 8 and above. Um, I think node of node 4 just reached end of life. Um, so yeah, maybe I'm leaving someone behind here, but probably not. So. We're going to just test on 8. So I'm going to create a new branch called semantic release. And I'm going to say, this is, this is an important part. So I'm going to use a prefix here when committing, um, which indicates to semantic release what kind of change this is. It's a feature, which means we could also call it a fix. But as a feature, it'll bump the minor version number and create a release when we when we ship it, when we merge the pull request. So here we go. Um, and if I push this up using my git push origin head command, I just usually type push and always forget what it's actually doing. That should push it up. Use g to open it up and we'll create a pull request. So pretty straightforward. Since it's just me, I'm not going to actually explain much of what's going on. It looks like Travis is now turned on for this branch, for this repo. But an important thing to know about Travis and semantic release is that you have to have There, it's in there now. Shoot. Let's configure it. Okay, you have to make sure that both of these switches, pushed branches and pull requests are turned on, which they are. So why then am I only seeing one? Okay, it just took a little while. So both of these are, are running right now. Um, once this test passes, assuming it passes, um, just the act of merging the pull request will trigger an action in Travis that will cause the semantic release to happen and we'll actually see a new publish going to NPM. So in the meantime, while I'm waiting for that to happen, I'm going to write a readme. And I always tend to cheat a little bit with this. So I have a package called package.json to readme. Also, if you use ghub.io, it's a tool, a website, that will direct you straight to the source repository for any given NPM package. So you can skip the NPM website. Um, so package.json to readme, 
It's just a, a command line tool that takes care of getting getting you kind of a boilerplate readme set up. So, uh, so we just type readme package.json, and by default, if you just run that, it'll, it'll, oops. Oh. Oh, we don't have all our dependencies installed because we actually used npx to run semantic release. So if I do npm install, we shouldn't see any more errors when running readme package.json. There we go. So if we look at just standard out here, we can see kind of a, some markdown. So I'm going to just pipe that into a file called readme.md. And now if we open it in our editor, we've got the basis of something. So by default, it kind of shows you what your dependencies are, what the license is, stuff like that. I always have to add usage. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to say C tests. Um, but normally I would write like a, a blurb here with some code snippets that show how to actually use this code. Um, but I'm going to take a shortcut here. So I'm going to go back to the master branch and demonstrate another handy little alias I use called QPR, which will actually create a branch based on the message I type and create a commit message and generate a PR. PR is using, again, hub has a command called pull request that you can use to generate a pull request. So I'm just kind of recycling the message I typed to QPR to use it to name the branch, to name the commit message, and to name the pull request. So if I type QPR feet add readme, creates a branch, commits the change, pushes to GitHub, creates a PR, opens the PR. So a lot of steps taken care of um, for free there. Now all we have to do is wait for this to pass. If I go back to the old thing, oh, it looks like Travis failed. Why did Travis fail? Oh, because, okay, this I forgot this was going to happen. Okay, so we're seeing all these errors from standard because we were running our watch command, but we didn't actually run npm test. So if I run uh, npm test locally, we'll see, oh, we get some failures from standard. So this is because we're using all these globals that are automatically added to, when you run just test.js, or just jest, which looks for a test.js by default. Um, it's injecting all these globals into the into the scope when running that code. So test is injected, expect is there. So people have different feelings about this. I think it's actually really convenient for when you're writing tests and you just jump in there and there's not a lot of nonsense here. It's also nicer than Mocha in a way because Mocha doesn't come with a any kind of assertion library. So this is like the most batteries included node test tool that I've used so far. So anyway, we I think we can actually just do npe standard dot n dot jest true. And if we look at our package.json, you'll see what that's set. So standard has this thing called n where you can specify um, oh and this I guess that's a bug. That should be through like the boolean, not like the string. Um, so this will tell standard, okay, we're using jest, so if you see things like expect or test, don't worry about it. So let's see if this passes now. Yes, okay. So this change, we actually, we want to bring it into that other branch. So I'm going to use, what is B? All right, there's a few cool things in here. So B gives me kind of an interactive thing for choosing branches. So um, I'm going to switch to the semantic release. And the way that that's working is it's using this tool called pick. And I think you can just brew install pick, um, which is like you basically pump 
new line delimited text into it, pipe new line delimited text into it, and it um, creates a prompt that allows you to pick one of them. You can even do like filter typing to filter down the list. And what is branches? Okay, some long git command that I found on Stack Overflow, undoubtedly. Okay, so, oh, but it didn't let us switch to that other branch. Okay, so stash the changes, switch branches, and there's a conflict in packages. Why is that a conflict? What do you mean? <laughs> Travis deploy once extraneous. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. Um, hmm, what do I do when a stash goes wrong? Ah, I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, here's one way to deal with it. I'm just going to run semantic release setup again. Oh, bad JSON. It's bad, bad. Okay, forget this. Um, I'm going to just back out my changes. Oh, geez. Now I'm in some, some hellish space where everything's broken. Okay, please wait. This is the readme one. Let's go to the other pull request. So how did those changes get all back down? Shoot. Um, let's just do some stack overflowing. This is a time where everybody gets to find out that I suck at Git. So the answer is Git reset. Okay. So I'm going to do git reset index.js and git reset package.json. And then we'll check out the changes, pull. Okay, fine. What does it look like? That's not what we expected to see from semantic release, is it? Okay, when in doubt. Get rid of the local branch. Fetch the remote branch. Look at the changes. Where the heck? Why am I not seeing those changes when I just pull down the branch? Git branch set upstream to origin semantic release. Semantic release. It says I'm already up to date, but I'm not. Don't understand. Oh, weird. Okay, so Visual Studio Code was showing me an outdated version of the file for some reason. Ugh. Okay, very annoying. But now we should be in a good place to be able to reapply those changes to uh, 
fixed standard. So standard dot n dot just true. Okay, again, Visual Studio Code not showing changes. Weird. And now if we run tests, we're good. Okay, that was a little bit roundabout, but we're in a good place now. These new lines got added by standard fix. Um, when you run standard with the fix flag, it tries to fix problems for you automatically. So let's commit this. Push it up. Go check it out. And we'll wait for that one to run. And the read the readme one is probably failing too. For the same reason. Um, I'm going to keep recording just until we get a release out for this to show that uh, semantic release is actually working as expected. In the meantime, what can we do in the meantime while we're waiting for Travis? Um, oh, okay, I wanted to actually put this thing to the test. So um, let's create a new project called numero nim study and what do we need in this project we need a package json we can just say pass the yes flag that'll just choose a bunch of defaults for us we want to add we want to install numero nims plural and we want to install um, an array of English words, and we want to install count array values. And you'll see in a minute what this is useful for. So let's touch index.js, create the file. So words and um, numero nim and count values. So, uh, let's say words dot for each word console dot log numero nim. Word and run this and see what happens. Okay, cool. We get a bunch of numeronyms. So, what I wanted to do was actually collect them, call them nims, Okay, 274,918 words, numero nimified. So I wanna see how many, how many uh, numero nimified words are um, common. So let's say count values just takes an array of values and counts them and sorts them by their counts. So uh, let's just do the top the top 20 most common numeronyms in the English language. So, wow. Okay, so there are 1,800 words that are nine letters long, start with S, end with S. So that's pretty interesting. 
thousand words that start with C and have ten letters and end with S. Let's look at some more of them. This changes to a hundred. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the practical application of this but is, but it's kind of curious just to find out. It looks like S is very common. What if we filtered out words that end with S, just for fun? What do we get now? Oh. Filter. Hmm, okay. So... Yeah, again, maybe this isn't useful at all, but it's interesting to, to look at. Um, okay, these tests passed. That was a good little distraction. Okay, so let's merge this pull request because it has a semantic commit there. It should trigger a, a release. So if we have a tendency to just delete branches right away. If we go back over to numero nims, we should see a 1.1.0 release here in the next couple minutes. And then this will need to, this branch will need to be rebased with master. So I will do that while we wait for that. So let's go back to master. M is just git check out master. Pull. Go into our readme branch. Rebase with master. Force push it. Anytime you do a rebase locally, you have to force push changes. So now we jump back up there and look. Let's see if this released yet. No, not yet. Okay, I'm going to wait on that one. I'm frozen. Okay, well, I hope this was useful for you, uh, and thanks for watching. Bye.